name is Sira Benotha. I'm a philosophy professor who teaches philosophy in the old Socratic way, simply by dialoguing. After practicing it in jail in Catalonia and in Central America, I have now decided to take this exercise of dialogue to Northern Ireland. Well, to put it mildly, today is a day of opportunity. Here in Belfast, there are still many issues to be addressed, but they have gone a long way towards reconciliation. Since the Good Friday Agreement, the steps are taken in a peaceful environment, and Catholics and Protestants even cooperate to show their most significant places to tourists. Hi, hello. Hello. I'm Sarah. It's nice to meet you, Sarah. Joan. Hi, nice to meet you. How are you? I'm fine, fine. Mm -hmm. Don't forget any questions you want to yeah. ask. I Do oh. not hesitate, OK? <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Great. Okay. Murphy's well, Law. Uh, what yeah. can go wrong will go wrong. <laughs> I've been doing tours for 10 years. I do them on a Saturday and a Sunday. Uh -huh. Okay. See, I've, I've got people from all over the world. I'm an ex-political prisoner. I was in prison almost 18 years. The first time I went into prison, I wasn't involved in anything. I was totally innocent. They went to arrest my brother. My brother wasn't at home, so it just decided take me instead. My interrogation lasted about 36 hours. That's when you became political. Yes, that's it. That's, that, that was it. Yeah. No, so that's when you said, yeah, I'm, I'm not... I'm... Enough's enough. Yeah. Yeah, I said enough. It came to the stage where I said to myself, I'm going to have to do something. Now, yeah. I'm being honest, I'm not just saying this, I do not like violence. Yeah. I'm, I'm not a violent person. Hmm. But it came to the stage where I says, if I don't do something, I'm being like a card. Yeah. So I felt I had to do something. In every Catholic area in Belfast, there's a memorial built in recognition of the sacrifice of volunteers. And a lot of memorials, you also have the civilian dead. That's the people who were killed in the area. This here is probably one of the most impressive ones in Belfast. It's a lovely memorial. It's well kept. And does that, like, would everybody deserve the same memorial? Everybody goes from their own perspective. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? From my perspective, our volunteers who fought for freedom are entitled to a memorial. You know, there, there are people I would say, well, say I have to go past RUC memorials, British Army memorials, I accept it. I just say, well, that's it, that's the way life is. I don't particularly like it, but that's life. We all have to be tolerant like that mm -hmm. and accept that. Why is it that we're meeting there? This is neutral. This is between our side and their side. We always meet about the middle. Because I couldn't go over and meet him over there, and he couldn't come and meet me. That's why we meet here. Big hey, cool, how are you? Okay. Hi, I'm Sarah. Okay. Sarah, good to meet you. Nice I know, to meet you. I know Hi. Large Hi. Mavic. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Must have been better circumstances. Yeah, yeah. Not, a yeah. Great yeah. Life. not not the best weather. Oh, no. We must stay. Yeah, that's here. I believe you, folks. Yep. I got us. Okay. Yep. okay. 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 For me, as a unionist, that would not be the sort of area that I would um, feel comfortable uh, walking about in and the same for nationalists who would come onto the Shango. Mm -hmm. I, became, I became heavily involved with the UVF yeah. around 1981, and I became a very active gunman. Yeah. And uh, eventually, after being arrested, I was given four life sentences and 357 years wow. for all the other offences, and went down to the H blocks. Mm -hmm. And while I was in prison, when I was... How 20, long were 20, you in prison for? 16 years. 
16. And when I went to prison, when I was there five years, I turned away from violence. The wall was built because when both sides clashed, there was nothing separating them because they lived side by side in the same conditions in the streets. And after two nights of vicious rioting, um, the British army came in um, to separate both sides. And the British army's uh, barricades were very temporary. And when do you think this will disappear? If you speak to the people that live in the shadow of the walls, they don't feel that the, there's enough confidence in their communities. What do you think about this mural? I think that the I think the mural is, um, in one way, I would like to see it being more progressive. Uh, I think there's a lot more to our culture than just gunmen. But I understand that it, it's a process, and we cannot just simply come along and paint over it and say that what these young men uh, died so young for, their sacrifice is now forgotten about, because these young men have families. I came to understand why and how someone ends up deciding to become actively involved in an armed conflict. What's it like to be part of it? And how can one make the move towards peace? I will do that by bringing together people to sit at the same table. People who would have years ago fought against each other. Because I believe that by sitting the different voices of the same conflict around a table, we might be able to gain a better understanding of why it happened. And also, I hope this can help other regions in the world who are suffering or have suffered similar conflicts, such as the Basque Country. Winston Irvine is the spokesperson of a unionist party with political links to a paramilitary organization. Jackie McDonald was one of the leaders of a unionist group. He spent five years in prison. Lee Levis is a former British soldier. Roger McCollum is a former police officer with the Northern Irish Police. Evelyn Glenn Holmes is a Republican. The British state accused her of being a member of the IRA, but she has never been sentenced. Michael Colbert is a former member of the IRA. He spent 15 years in prison. Thank you, really, for being here and for accepting the commitment. We're really very thankful. Our aim through this and through the hours that we're going to spend together is to learn about your personal, individual experiences and, and processes. We believe that there are things we need to learn and above all we need to learn the importance of, of dialogue and, and true dialogue. When we use the term dialogue, what, what we believe is that dialogue always implies not trying to convince anybody, but trying to understand others. And as a, as a first day or a first introduction, I would like each one of us to introduce ourselves. Uh, I'm Lee Lavis. Uh, I was born in 1971 uh, in Burton-on-Trent in the Midlands in England. I was brought up in a very sort of working class sort of background. My father uh, had been a soldier. He'd had loads and loads of jobs by the time I was born, was a lorry driver, and my mum was a cleaner. So when I finished school, I finished with no qualifications. So uh, I joined the army in 1989. Roger McCallum, uh, 62 years of age. I was born in 1953 in uh, Port Rush, up on the North Coast. I always probably thought about joining the police. I was a police officer in the Royal Ulster Constabulary and the police service of Northern Ireland for a total of about 28 years, from 1976 until 2004. Royal Ulster Constabulary George Cross Memorial Garden uh, was set up in 2003. It memorialises the names of all the dead police officers, the 302 who died during the Troubles. It is very much a place of tranquility where people can go and reflect and think and remember. He was the guy who was in the bed next to me uh, when I was in the training centre. 
a guy called Kenny Lynch, Constable Kenny Lynch, and he was killed just about a year after we left the training centre on the 2nd of June uh, 1977. A really, really nice guy. We spent seven weeks in the same bedroom together, a dormitory with beds beside each other, and it really brings home to you the fact, why him, why not me? You suddenly begin to realise as you open your eyes that, uh, heck, there's a heck of a lot more stories to be told in Northern Ireland or the North of Ireland than, than maybe I was told as a child. And for, for example, I knew nothing about Irish history. I could tell you all about the six wives of Henry VIII and the English Civil War. So, you know, we have to have these uncomfortable conversations and we have to talk to each other and empathise and hear the other person's stories because I certainly haven't got all the truth. And it's could good I, to I talk to folk. Can I comment on, yep. your, your, on, on yourself, yep. uh, Roger? Um, you see, you sound as if you're insulting people when you suggest that they haven't been told the full truth about their history. I mean, from a Republican perspective, and I don't mean an insult to Jackie or yourself here now, but uh, from our perspective, it's so obvious that we are a colonial situation. Yep. You know, if we were black or brown or whatever, it would be quite obvious that we were being ruled by a foreign country because Britain in the main and its government was a white ruler who did it in Africa, who did it in India, who did it in the Near East. But because we look very like the English, people can't, don't seem to accept that it is exactly the same situation. Do you ever think of that? Well, very good point. But I think in relation to us, I mean, certainly, I think our family were planted here from Scotland for stealing sheep about 1608 or something. So, and we feel that this is, I suppose, our country or our area to be in. I never looked upon it as a colony. I looked upon it as part of the United Kingdom. Having said that, at the moment, I am most comfortable with the phrase Northern Irish. You know, for me, it's fairly straightforward. You know, I'm a native of this land. I certainly don't accept that I'm a colonial um, person who is trying to, you know, uh, oppress uh, people who are, you know, working class, same as me. You know, I have no, no power, I have no riches, you know, so um, by birthright, I'm British. I was born into the state of Northern Ireland, which is part of the United Kingdom. My name is Winston Irvine. I grew up in the Shankill area, which is predominantly unionist, Protestant, loyalist, working class area of Belfast. I have a very poor working class uh, background. We are in a very beautiful building. It is the Shankill Library. I think this library represents and reflects the characteristics of this community in terms of uh, the future and also the past. I think for me, education actually is the spine in which everything else should be attached to. One of our greatest human needs is to be understood. When we feel we are understood, we can make a connection. And I think that is true for peace building and for reconciliation. It's quite different for me because I grew up in England. The only time I sort of remember it coming on our radar when I was growing up is, is when there was an incident, a British soldier was killed or someone was killed. And the general attitude amongst the people around me as I remember it was, essentially those people are different to us um, and we should just get out or pull out. They, the, the people in England tended not to think of it as a colony. They just sort of ignored it. It, it was kind of a way of it abdicating um, sort of British responsibility. I'm Irish. I, I was born in Ireland, I, I am Irish. The division of my country was along the lines of what could Britain hold still in Ireland? And it was the North which had the majority of, of loyal citizens, loyal to the Crown. And in effect, my community then became hostages. So we were never welcome here. 
you know, we never felt that. But that, I didn't feel no, that. I'm a, I know you I, didn't, but uh, you know, I un and I understand that. I I could get angry sometimes, though. Really, the closer I come, or the closer I understand your community, to say, did you not see what was happening to us? You know, you should have been our allies. You should have been the one saying, we're walking out of the shipyard since you won't employ a Catholic care. You know, we were being told by the unionists, you know, there's, there's always been class issues here, always. Of course. There may be class issues with Catholics in some ways, but there was many class issues with working class loyalism. There wasn't even loyalists then. The people didn't call anybody a loyalist. Everybody was just a unionist, a Protestant unionist. Uh, and they were telling us we never had it so good. So we believed them. It'd be very easy for me to say, let's forget about the past and let's move forward from here and draw a light. But I think we need to do more than that because as Shakespeare said, the past is prologue. We need to in some way look at the past to see what went wrong, but not get absolutely caught up and absolutely immersed in what happened. So 3,700 people died, 302 police officers, many, many more injured, many maimed physically and mentally. A difficult one, but I hear what you're saying. And just a wee thing on that, when we talk about, you know, the 3,000 mark, um, if we extrapolated that, you know, to the USA, mm -hmm. more people died here than died in the Vietnam War. You know, that's, mm -hmm. I think when you, t you, you, you make that, extrapolate those figures to show the impact, because we're a tiny, tiny place, mm -hmm. and the impact of that many lives lost has of course affected our whole society. It's fractured our society. So it has damaged our society. Well. There's no single person who has who hasn't somehow been affected by. He no? couldn't have lived here. I mean, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Probably there are some people. God knows where they're living somewhere far away and with a big wall around their their place. But I honestly don't believe that there's anyone here who has been unaffected by the trauma that was conflict. There's something I need to do before continuing with the dialogue. I need to meet some of those people who are directly affected by the violence from all sides. I want to hear their voices and hear what they think about the present and the future of Northern Ireland. My name's Peter Heathwood. Uh, on the 27th of September, 1979, I came home from work early and the doorbell rang and my wife opened the door and she squealed, gunmen, gunmen. There was a struggle. I knocked one gunman down, but the second one shot me, hit the spine, which is why I'm in the wheelchair. My father seen me in the body bag and he took a heart attack and dropped dead. The attack was done by loyalists. My name is Alex Bunting. I'm a member of the Victim Survivors Forum for Northern Ireland. I was uh, blown up in an undercar booby trap bomb by the IRA. Hello. Good morning, everybody. My name is Anne Travers. I'm the youngest of six children. I grew up in Belfast and my father was a resident magistrate. On the 8th of April 1984, he was walking home from Mass with my mum and my sister Mary, who was 23 years of age. She was shot by a separate gunman who shot her once in the back and died in my mother's arms. And with that, the gunman who had been holding his gun underneath the newspapers started to shoot Dad and Dad fell down and um, he was shot six times and he survived remarkably. Um, the gunman who shot Mary walked over and held the gun to my mum's forehead and pulled the trigger and the gun jammed. And he pulled it again and the gun jammed. And with that, the gunmen ran off. They ran down the alleyway. What would have to happen for you to say, now we have the truth or now we feel acknowledged or now we feel that there is justice. I can't forgive on behalf of my sister. That's impossible. Um, and she, because she's dead, she has every right to justice. That human right, that basic right to life, cannot be taken away from our dead. I do not think I will get justice, but I would like the truth. I would like the state to say, we made a mistake. They should, we were involved, but you know, blah, it shouldn't, it shouldn't have been you. Uh, my mother's still alive at 85. I would like her to get that truth. I agree with my colleagues that need truth and justice, certainly I do. But am I there to try and make compromise? And I know it's hard for her to sit and talk to people who you know 
did go out and commit atrocities. And I think all well, that I would look from them is honesty and truth about what did happen, what did go on. And that's from the, the players, or whatever you want to call them, the terrorists on both sides, loyalist, republican, on the governments. In that sense, what do you think can be your role in making your dream that your grandchildren or your children live in a, in a peaceful Northern Ireland? What role can you play in that sense? I'll tell you another wee story of the colleagues will bear with me. 1922, the foundation of the state, there was extreme violence in Belfast which killed 500 people. My father was six years of age. He attended a funeral of his cousin who was 17 who was shot dead. So here's 1922, my daddy's at this funeral, not knowing that 50 years later he was going to be a victim. So I do not want any of my grandchildren having to go through the same experience we all went through somewhere down the line because in this part of the world, history does repeat itself. And if we can, by our meetings, by our conversations, by reaching out to each other and understanding each other, if we can prevent that happening in the future, we will have achieved something. Many people say that violence doesn't start when there's a finger that, that pulls the trigger, but starts in, in people's hearts and minds and ambitions and etc. So if you were to give an explanation on why did this end up being so violent? What would you refer to? You know, there's a whole lot of different ways of looking at it. But once the violence started, it wasn't about anything. It was about you fighting us and us fighting you. Once the violence started, logic went out the window. We just fought because we, that was the thing to do. It wasn't about whether it was right or wrong. It was just deemed necessary as far as I was concerned. I used to dress in the morning uh, they put clothes on me, to, you know, well, this, I might be killed in these clothes, you know, and I had to look at my wardrobe for 10 minutes before I put them on, or I might be arrested in these clothes. Life wasn't the same anymore. There wasn't, it wasn't about uh, your rights or your rights or my rights. It was about, they're killing us, we're killing them. That's where it all degenerated to. And now, because we're having these conversations, and it's brilliant, we don't have a problem with each other and we can sit and reason with each other and talk to each other. It's just, it came 3,700 lives too late sort of thing. But we're here now, and we'll see what we're going to do with it. It's 800 years for us. Uh, there's well, 800 you No, know, but it's not 800 years for us, because we weren't here 800 years ago. <laughs> we were. <laughs> and then they, came in, then they came in. No. What we would well, say is no, that, would, that I, any society yeah. has to be Article 2 compliant, first of all. Any government has to do, be that. We also have to be cognizant of equality. If I've learned anything, if there is not true equality, if there is not true democracy, if there is not true human rights centric society, then eventually those who feel oppressed will be forced into a corner and they will come out fighting. And the sadness of what happened here is it is the history of mankind. It is the history. I've never heard or seen any government who's went to a people with a grievance and said, what have we done wrong? Tell us in order that we can rectify it. No, they wait until the locals rebel or the, the natives rebel, and then they fight them, and then eventually they sit down at the table to negotiate. I can't stop thinking that this group of people were enemies not that long ago. They could have killed each other during the conflict, and now they are talking. There were many people who made it possible. I want to meet one of them. He worked for years building bridges between the communities. My name is Harold Good. My life has been that of a minister of the Methodist Church, which is part of the Protestant tradition. Part of my responsibility in the late 70s was as a chaplain here in the Crumlin Road prison. We need to be honest about our history. We need to be honest about our politics. You mean truth is necessary to move on? Absolutely. Not just truth about what happened during these troubles, but I'm talking about an honest understanding of our history, which brought us into this conflict. 
Well, we need to be honest about what we didn't do as well as what we did do. I mean, there was injustice in this part of Ireland. So that's how you explain, in the end, the reason why it all started? Yeah. Because of discrimination? Yeah. And we were silent when we should have been speaking about that. You know, we, we, we should be honest about that. Speaking and, about that discrimination? Yeah, and confronting it. Uh, but our, our politicians didn't want us to, uh, to deal with those issues. And why did that discrimination start? It's a very familiar story. It's the story of a settler people and a native indigenous people trying to share the same piece of ground. Now, where have you heard that story before? <laughs> what? In many places. Many places. Some North America, very... South Africa, your own country. When we were trying to work through this whole business of the early release of prisoners within the Good Friday Agreement, uh, people were very troubled by this. And uh, I remember inviting a man called Brian Curran, whose name you may be familiar with, mm. a South African lawyer involved in their process. And um, I asked him to come and talk about the South African experience. And after he'd spoken, somebody said, but Brian, what about justice? And he said, this isn't about justice. You can't go to a widow and an orphan and say, we're releasing the killer of your loved one in the interest of justice. He said, this is not about justice. He said, this is about giving all parties to the conflict an opportunity to share in a new beginning whether you believe they deserve it or not. And I said, Brian, that's interesting. Our word for that is grace. And he said, well, if that is your word, keep preaching it, because you're going to need an awful lot of it. And how right he was. But without that generosity, grace, call it what you will, we can't really move forward from a situation of conflict, giving each other an opportunity to share a new beginning, whether or not we feel we or they deserve it. That's grace. The concept of grace keeps spinning around in my head. Now I'm aware of the amount of empathy, generosity and effort that is required to overcome such a conflict. Today, um, I would like to explore, let's say, the, the next step. So when you decide to engage, meaning when Roger decides to engage in the RUC or when Lee decides to engage in the British Army, in the UDA, in the IRA. And especially, uh, I'm interested in the, in the emotions that were like behind that, that engagement and along the fight. I don't know. I'd never give much credence to the term folk memory, but somewhere there was an awareness in me of our, our militant past within republicanism although there was no real republicanism, activism, in the late 1960s. But within the civil rights, there, there was a rumbling of something's going to have to happen. Um, but then I was just too busy chasing my girlfriend and playing football. And, but then Bloody Sunday would have been the catalyst for me. Um, and how do you remember that moment, like that moment of maybe enough is enough, or...? It was quite scary, because I, I didn't know anybody doing anything within that situation. I didn't know anybody. I had to... I spent about two or three months seeking out the IRA, and they were all around me, but I didn't know who the hell they were. No, that's true. And how did that work? How would you...? I eventually I literally asked the man in the bar, And he gave you... Well, he eventually got somebody to, to make contact with me. Um, but I, mean, I, couldn't, I couldn't find the IRA, and it was all around me. So that would... That's that. And then thereafter, I mean... I suppose and were you when, scared back then? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I was scared, yeah. Um, but... Because um, you knew what that would entail, that decision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, was, I was a social worker. So it wasn't... I wasn't a, a child. I was, 
I think it was 24 years of age, you know. So I wasn't, um, you know, uh, a 17-year-old with a lot of time in my hand. I was, I was full time in work. But I, I sort of, I must have been grown into that awareness, but I didn't know at the time. That's me. I'm a former uh, IRA prisoner. The area which I would have lived in as a young man was a very Republican area. I took part in a few marches, a bit of radicalisation, but not much. But then Bloody Sunday happened, and I realised that politically I had to be aware because civil rights weren't going to be given. So thereafter, I joined her IRA. And I am director of Kostya in the near Kimmy. Uh, I head up a network of 12 offices which looks after the interests of the former IRA prisoners in Ireland. It's very, very difficult for political ex-prisoners here to get work. People think with the, the armed conflict over that everything is sorted. There is a peace, but it's not a peace with justice. I have a very different question now. Um, I guess living in, in conflict or living in war, however we, we want to call it, affects every dimension of, of our lives. And I'm interested in understanding, according to you, how, how that affected friendship, for example, or how that might have affected uh, love. I had the perfect life. I had a great job playing football, cricket, perfect family. Life could not have been better. And the more involved I got in paramilitary activity, I lost everything. Just I had to make a decision. I'm lucky my family still speaks to me. You know, we sort of went through the bad times. So what I never realised was when I wasn't living at home, uh, every time there was a body found, they thought it was me. There used to be a saying, probably existed in your community too, that <coughs> sometimes women were relieved when their husbands were captured. Women were relieved? Relieved, because you knew where he was. Well, maybe not relieved might be too strong a word, but there was, although it was bad being captured and they knew that they were going to prison, but at least there was one thing you knew they weren't going to die. You know, they were going oh, to walk out of prison. Yep. And I think that there's, whilst a lot of the discussion does, and, and academic research does centre around ex-prisoners and their role in the peace <coughs> process, et cetera, et cetera. But I think there's an untold story there of, of the women who ran to those tales for years and years and kept the family unit together, you know, and they're the unsung heroes of keeping the community and their families going. I grew up in a small Catholic ghetto of the Short Strand in East Belfast. It was a nationalist area. I'm the daughter of an IRA man. I am the granddaughter of an IRA volunteer, so republicanism is very much a part of my life. My life's philosophy would be that, simplistically, I am always on the side of the oppressed and I will never be on the side of the oppressor. They are the wives and mothers and family members of IRA prisoners and of IRA martyrs. By providing a space like this for them to come together, not to mourn, maybe sometimes to cry, but mainly to laugh and to know that there's someone there who understands exactly where you're coming from and what your experience has been. Just one thing I'll never understand. Every damn rebel seems to be a man. <laughs> I wasn't in the UDA initially. I was a, a vigilante. And people in the UDA had asked me time and time again to join, but I was happy. I had a great wife, two kids. I lived in a, in a house, an executive house. Life was perfect. And uh, Bloody Friday happened. Then my mother died. And then it just, a fella came and asked me just at the right time. And I went, got, got sworn in that night. And we're all waiting on the commander coming back from San Diego and he walked in and says, well, not by wearing masks, it's anymore in the street. So I, <laughs> I never you, wore a mask, well, not on the street. Uh, that night, we went out on patrol round to Murray. And uh, a few of us, after we did the official bit, 
a few of us were just walking about in our ordinary clothes and the RUC stopped us and said, uh, who are you? He says, we're Liverpool Supporters Club. And one of them says to me, do you think there's any need for the UDA around tomorrow because there's never any trouble? And I says, well, maybe that's because there's a UDA. And he says, I'll have to watch you. That was too quick an answer, he said. So when we got back, I got promoted. It's only in the UDA a couple of hours, they got promoted. <laughs> <laughs> That's the quickest wow. promotion yeah, well, in history. But it, uh, it just progressed from there. Once the conflict began, I changed. Circumstances changed. Adrenaline going out doing things that I uh, shouldn't really have been doing. I was drinking too much sometimes. I was having affairs, to tell you the truth. And my home life just totally broke down. That's the Ulster Defence Association and the Ulster Freedom Fighters. And that means so much, even to the community members here. Those two organisations, although they're, they're, they're inextricably linked, they are the key, they, they are the protectors of this estate, I feel like, still in people's minds. This is probably the most emotional part of Northern Ireland for me, this particular piece of ground here. Don't believe that loyalism should be involved in any sort of criminality, drug dealing, whatever. There was a time that was necessary. Loyalists paramilitaries robbed banks, robbed secure core vans, extortion and building sites. I was guilty of it myself. But once the conflict ended, there was no need for that anymore. The greatest security risk to me since I got out of prison was through feuds within loyalism, within the Ulster Defence Association. I lived in the second house there. There was trees in all the gardens, there was bushes, all had to be cut down. There was a barrier across the street here. There was people in, in a flat upstairs for six months, 24 hours a day, there was security on my house. That never happened when we were fighting Republicans, never. And so when it was internal, that was the biggest threat. I was getting two death threats a day from people who used to be colleagues or comrades. Uh, the disruption that that are put on the community, and they accepted that. They willingly came out. They fed us, give us hot drinks, coffee, tea. So it was cold, it was wet. People had to go to their work the next morning. But again, and, and the disruption to the community, but the community never complained. They came out and welcomed us. They fed us, they give us hot drinks. And they said, keep it up lads, you're doing a good job. And we stuck it out, stuck it out for six months. And at the end, we won. I tried to get that stopped. He tried to get it stopped, I, 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 but no. If you don't let these fellas go home, they'll be shooting me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. In your previous thinking, you would have reflected on the fact that you might end up in jail, you might end up having to do... Whatever. Mm -hmm. You were aware of all that. Yeah. Well, when I joined the UDA in 1972, we, I didn't join the UDA to kill anybody. We joined it to defend our village. We, were, we, we walked around the streets of the Murray every night. Uh, there was about 40 men in, in, in the company. A mile up the road was Seymour Hill, which was sort of two estates put together. There was 80 or 90 UDA men there. But nobody had joined it to kill anybody. It was purely a defensive organisation at that time. You know, that was one decision. And then you make more decisions. You just didn't make one decision in your life or through the conflict. You make a series of decisions. You decide what level or if you're going to go any further than you've already been. And, and that's all because of what's happening around you. And so we were reactionary in many ways. You know, we reacted to IRA violence. Yeah, I agree with them. Agree to a degree. To a degree. I agree that 
probably the majority of people who eventually moved in saw it like that. But our activities, per se, were against the state. The state and its apparatus. Now I can understand Jackie and his friends interpreting actions, which included some of them, as being against them. You know, there were bombings, which literally went wrong in the IRA. I think, I hope they've apologised for them, which went wrong. But in the main, it was the state. I mean, you don't put bombs off in towns because you don't like a person. There has to be mm -hmm. an ideological underpinning why somebody would learn how to make a bomb and go out and plant it and blow it up. You know, it can't be because I don't like him. Well, it shouldn't be because of that. Yeah. And in the case of the Republicans, it wasn't because of that. But naturally, unfortunately, innocent people were killed. That's my view. Mm -hmm. So in um, his case, he would say, I wanted to defend ourselves. You would say we wanted to fight against the government. Did it feel that way, Roger? How, how was it for you? You know it's not personal. You know that the attack, whether it be a stone or whether it be a bullet or whether it be an explosion, is against the uniform or against what the uniform represents rather than you as an individual. For me, from an individual level, I come to the conflict from a different point of view altogether. I'm looking to escape where I'm from and I'm looking for a job and some status. Um, so I joined the I remember in them days that they used to have a, an ideal recruit that was in all the uh, advertisements called Frank. And when I used to walk past the Army Careers Office, I seem to remember Frank was doing a lot of skiing, <laughs> um, a lot of canoeing, and he seemed to be standing around in bars with his mates a lot. Uh, I don't remember Frank being dressed in, a, in, a, in an Army uniform on the border in South Armagh or, or patrolling West Belfast. Um, so I, I joined the army and by virtue of joining the army, I had the perception I was being sent to be at war with the IRA, that I was fighting the IRA. When I got involved in reconciliation work, dialogue work, and once I got involved with bringing British soldiers back to Northern Ireland for them to visit uh, and meet with the people that they'd only previously interacted with as soldiers. Once I got involved in that kind of work, encompassing those two kinds of fields, it was quite natural that ultimately I, uh, that I would come into contact with members of families and individuals whose lives have been directly impacted on by the actions of the British Army or individual British soldiers. And it was through this context that I met someone I would consider my best friend, uh, Fiona Gallagher. Fiona's brother was, was killed by a member of the British Army in the early 1970s. It wasn't that it was never going to be a case that I would never speak to somebody who was from the forces. It was just a case if there was never an opportunity. When you're in the middle of your own grief, you don't see, uh, you don't see outside of that. It's always about the hurt that's happened to you or, or your people. You were yours, and that that is, and, and I have said that myself. I I was guilty of that for a long time. Um, just been in that that bubble of of um, this is all about my grief. But it's I think I think I suppose really to be to be honestly, it was whenever I had the children then it was like. Um, looking at them and thinking that they were never going to grow up the way I grew up. Was for one, I didn't want that for them. But I was so determined in my mind that I was never going to pass on to them, you know, a hatred or um, a bitterness or um, a real prejudice against uh, anybody who was Protestant, anything different, or in the army or English or whatever, because it never worked for me. Do you want to know one of the, the great ironies I find of, of being involved in the kind of interactions I'm involved with, uh, with the nationalist community? The kind of conversation we have now isn't usually the kind of conversation we have, is it? We usually chat on the phone. No, about as mates and things like that. We, we, we don't see it. Our, part, our relationship isn't defined by the fact that your brother was killed by the British Army and I was a British soldier. Um, <laughs> I think we'd be mates even if that wasn't Aye, the that was, exactly. We came together because of that. Mm. 
what was your role? Like, what was one day of, of I, your it, life? I saw it like? as my role was to patrol, and if I saw a man with a gun who was going to harm me, harm any of the people with me, or harm a member of the civilian population, my job was to stop him doing it by killing him if need be. I was never taught to shoot guns out of hands or, or to wound people in legs. I was, I was taught to shoot them. That's how I saw my role. And if I saw a gunman with a, with a gun or with a detonator box, I certainly wasn't going to stop beforehand and say, are you loyalist or are you... Report he was getting... That's how simplified I, I, I saw my enemy. I didn't think in terms of loyalism, unionism, republicanism. And how do you feel the day after... So after the first day, you have to go out in the street and... Um, Should somebody? Well, it, it wasn't like that. It, it, no. The first day that you go out and it's traumatizing. It, it's, that's that. yeah, you're worried more about being shot than they are. Yeah, I don't know yeah. how to how to frame the question. I think Jackie makes a very good point. Your, yeah. your major your major thought isn't to go out and harm someone. No, no, I it's don't. more you being harmed. So my major major preoccupation the, was with there's one day where you have out. to do it. I guess. I can remember being um, out on patrol and the patrols coming under fire. Um, uh, with, 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 on one occasion, medium machine gun fire. The patrol comes under fire. You don't think about what's coming at you. You immediately go into that sort of training mode where, where contact, wait out, enemy left, you swing to the right. You go into all those mechanisms of, of sort of survival attack that you go into that's part of your training. So, you, so I can't really describe the emotions at, at, at the time of being shot out or shooting at someone else. I can describe the emotions afterwards. I can describe the emotions now. I mean, afterwards, you would get back and you'd have a little bit of time to your room and just, you'd have a, a bit of a shake and maybe sometimes you'd be sick, particularly if it had been a particularly close shave. One guy in our regiment captured an IRA man in South Armagh in 1984. He got the military medal. Once you get a, a, an award of that size, your career is in the army's made. Um, he was still a sergeant when I was touring for Manor in 1992. His whole career was made off doing that, so I desperately wanted to capture or, or, or kill an IRA man. So at the, at, at the time, I would have been kicking myself that I don't think I harmed anyone, but now I'm very, very grateful. That was a, an uber, uber patriot and wanted to be a hero and be someone glorious uh, and be known for doing glorious acts for my country. You weren't going out for a medal. You were going out to do something and hopefully get away with it. You know, it wasn't about medals. No, so absolutely. Yeah, you know, it was just that, that's what you had to do. That, that's that, that's where the circumstances took people. And I spoke to young lads in both the UVF and the UDA and members of the Red Hand as well. And I said, you don't get medals. See, every time you lift a drink, that's a medal. As time went on and the troubles progressed, people were actually wanted people to know. They wanted the notoriety. The troubles had went on that long, and those people saying, "There's your man," there, you know, everybody knew who he was, or everybody knew Lanny Murphy, or everybody knew Andy Terry, or everybody knew somebody, and wanted to say, "I, I want to be like him." Those people being bullied at school, or maybe uh, they were insignificant in, in their community. And you give them a gun, or you give them something to do, all of a sudden they are somebody. They've got some sort of respect in the community. They're not being bullied anymore. How would you describe the, the organizations that you represented? Uh, do you feel you had the chance to ask questions? To give you an idea, when we used to sit down in the cookhouse for our dinner, an officer would walk around and say, any complaints with the food? And the first person he turned around and went, well, actually, the officer would go, go and get him second helpings. So that was how much of a, of a right we had to complain about, even our basic treatment. You couldn't even complain about the food. But Michael, was it the good. same in, in the IRA? You were not allowed to ask questions, to raise questions? Um, I could only talk from personal experience. I'm not aware of um, any situations where there overly was need to question. Um, um, there was no need to question. Uh, I, I'm just talking from memory. I can't remember any. In the early days of, of the UDA, for example, because they were a defensive organisation, there was no problem asking questions because nobody had been there before. But once the Ulster Freedom Fighters came into being, came into existence, if anybody wanted to be 
in the Ulster Freedom Fighters. There was no questions asked. The, the question asked was, if you want to be in this, you're in it. And that's it. Once you, once you took that step, or once anybody took that step, there was no question to be asked. Okay. It was, you did what you were told. <laughs> I already spent some days with them and I understand why they engaged in conflict. But I still want to discover the personal journey of someone who has turned away from violence and faces a victim. How is it possible to come to terms when you've hurt somebody? Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you. Hi, John. Hi. How are you? Good, thank you. Yeah. Nice to meet you. How do you together? But if you wanna tell me what brought you to Joe, like mm. what's your connection, let's say? Quite apart from the obvious one that I killed Joe's father, um, it was the How? peace process and uh, being released as part of that process. Uh, what do you mean you killed her? Father? I killed Joe's father in an IRA operation. What, and, uh, what happened? Well, I was. Uh, uh, responsible for Joe's father's death because I was in the IRA and the IRA planted a bomb in the uh, a hotel where the, uh, the Tory, the Conservative Party at the time were holding a conference nearby and uh, the IRA targeted that hotel so uh, I had responsibility for that and I, I was sentenced in 85 uh, and sentenced to life but because of the peace process was released after 14 years you're coming out into this new situation and looking at the past and wondering what you can do to, you know, heal, perhaps, you know. And uh, a big part of that would be sitting down, talking to people we'd hurt, relatives of people we'd hurt. And that first meeting um, was very, very intense. So it was just the two of us in our own room, nobody else there. And when Pat came, he was very polite and showed sensitivity and, and then he talked about his political reasons of joining the IRA and I'd met other men and women who'd been in the IRA so I was quite familiar with the political reasons and I was just sort of thinking time to end it and then there was this moment of silence followed by Pat looking at me and saying I don't know anymore who I am I want to hear your anger and your rage and what can I do to help you? Now I was meeting, you know, the real human being um, beyond the label. And so at another hour, I couldn't sustain it anymore. And so I thanked him and, and he said, I'm really sorry I killed your dad. I don't think I knew at the time what it was about, but it was a disarming moment for me where I, I, I feel in a sense that I, I was jilted, you know, uh, uh, you know, out of my orbit, um, wasn't sure of my own thinking at that point. And again, I think it goes down to that, prof you know, how profound that moment was. Just sitting, talking with somebody, and you've killed their father. I think this is something that happens in conflict. Uh, you um, act on this uh, reduced um, view of those you're in conflict with. You don't, possibly can't, see them in the fullness of their humanity. And I think that can only be at the expense of your own humanity. So after all these years, 15 years <clears throat> since you met, Joe, what have you learned from Pat? I have empathy and understanding with all the players in the conflict. It doesn't mean I don't understand why people would use violence, but I, I think as soon as we create one victim, we're more likely to create another victimizer and the cycle goes on and on. So I'm interested in ending the cycle in me and this is really what it's about. It's I'm ending that cycle of violence and revenge. And so Pat's been my teacher in about healing that in myself. So it's like a mirror. So if I go back into blaming and wanting to make him responsible for my pain, then I'm back in that cycle. And what, what word would you use to 
explain or describe your bond? The thing with friends is I fall out with them all the time. I'm always falling out with friends, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> what I, I can say definitely, I take more care not to fall out with Joe because I, I think it's this um, um, awareness, heavy awareness of how important this is. You want to protect that. Joe's one of the few people I know I can have that level of conversation with. That somebody I've actually hurt. I know that I have friends in the movement. I can sit and talk to them. It exists at that level, and I'd be, you know, careful of those conversations too, you know. But with friends, I mean, you know, we fall out with them all the time, and it doesn't mean to say that we we have that at times been so strained that we decided we couldn't do it, you know. But we all seem to come back to it, you know. I don't think I've heard that before. I'm really touched by it. But. It's been hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I find it amazing how, you know, like, because I, I completely understand how hard it must be for both of you to, to stay there and, and no, and not, because the easiest way is, is to live. I'm deeply touched by Pat and Joe. It takes more courage to meet the victimizer than to continue the violent circle. And it also takes more courage to meet the victim and say sorry, to acknowledge the hurt you've provoked than anything else. These two courageous people should be a role model for all of us. There was a country in the world today in the situation we were in 1969 70, and they asked for our advice. How would we advise them? Talk. And it wouldn't be the armed struggle. Yeah, but no, wouldn't, no, would, no, 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 I'm saying talk and be heard. Mickey, you'd say it, no. Mm. Does that mean that, you know, so the logic of that position is that you, you would advise citizens now, wherever in the world, if, if the conditions weren't right, that they should take up? Didn't say. Arms. Well, uh, no, I'm asking. Uh, I'll just and I'll, take I'll up just... arms and, and, and well, uh, kill uh, people uh, in this day and age in the 21st century. Well, well, uh, well. I suppose the basic answer is yes. However, I'll have to qualify. It. Listen, if the circumstances exist which warranted, I have no moral qualms about it at all. If there's injustice, it has to be fought. Now, I, and I would say to you, people go. I'll give you a wee example here. We have a lot of Americans, students, come to us and ask us, why did you engage in violence? And I say, how did you get the British out of your country? They killed them in the 1700s. You know, they, they killed them, they forced them out by the point of a gun. And I say, don't come over here and moralise to us about using violence. What are you doing in Afghanistan? What are you doing in Iraq? I was talking to the Victims Commission the other day, and do you think um, justice and truth can be compatible? You know, some of the victims want to know who shot their father, who shot their husband, or who shot their brother. But if the UDA or the UVF or the IRA sent out a 17-year-old, they're up the door of number 36, and if a man answers, it shoot him. You know, these things did happen. The IRA or the UDA or the UVF killed that man. Does it matter who the 17-year-old was? He, would never, he never saw the man in his life before. He, he, he didn't know who he was. He was just called, called to go and uh, put a bomb under that car, shoot whoever comes out of that door or whatever. The individual was only doing what he was told. He had no malice or no, nothing, no personal grievance against the individual. That's what he joined that particular organisation to do, and that's what he did. So the IRA is guilty and the UVF is guilty. The Ulster Freedom Fighters and UDA is guilty. You know, Where's the state forces? Why, why do they need to have to know? No, I, I understand, but I'm in saying, what about the are you that saying you were really describing, as well? In that situation that you were describing, how can justice be applied or what would be just in such a situation? Well, I, 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 I've always said there is no answer to this. There certainly is no simple answer to this. The nearest I can get to it is 
no more victims. That, that, that's the key to this. That, that, we have to, have to make sure no more victims. So do we draw a line in the sand? No matter how difficult that may be for people. It's, a, it's like the victims. Do, they have an argument, to have, it, but they're holding everybody back. The way I describe it is, we're all trying to get through a door, and the victim's group comes along like a big swan with its wings open, and we can't get through the door. We need to get through that door, or eventually there will be more victims. I actually think we do need to think strategically about a policy framework in which to locate this whole discussion, because if it's not within the context of embedding and sustaining peace, then I think it's, it's a fundamental flaw and mistake. I think conflicts are totally over with the generation shift. I want to hear the voices of teenagers from a school that integrates Protestants and Catholics. <laughs> so I've heard you were all born on 1998. So that means you were born after? Good Friday, Friday, Friday Agreement. Yeah. Friday Agreement. And, and how does that sound like when you hear all those stories that your parents tell you? It's hard to believe, mm -hmm. like definitely, because it, because we grew up in such a peaceful environment, it's hard to believe that only 18 years ago we were like this. So it's definitely a big change. Do you even know about each other? Like, would you know? No, well, when we came here, I didn't, nothing ever came into my mind to go, are you Protestant or are you yeah, Catholic? Exactly. Just, it just doesn't, no one around. would ask. No one, yeah, there's no ask. need to, because you don't, you're an integrated skill mm -hmm. and it never even would have crossed my mind anyway to I think you, like you that. Even, yeah. It wouldn't even affect you, you know, if, yeah. say like, <laughs> This guy I've been friends with recently as a Protestant, you're not going to be like, <gasps> you know, it's not a big shocker. It's just kind of like, yeah. Everyone's so what? So no, so like, what? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And how do you see in the future? Yeah, you would love to see more integrated schools so more people can experience this. Because I have friends who go to predominantly Protestant schools, and if I was like, oh, my best friend's a Catholic, they're like, what? Like, why are you even talking to them? So just because they haven't experienced that friendship, you know, that kind of thing. So I just think personally, if there's more integrated schools, then everyone will be friends with each other and the conflict that there may still be will be completely gone. If all schools were integrated, there would be yeah. mm -hmm. no problems. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what's going to happen when your generation goes into politics? I think there'll be a massive change. Mm -hmm. yeah. Big time. Yeah, I think, I think there'll be a big change. change. The fact that we'll move forward through a generation that hasn't seen people killing each other in the streets every day we will be a lot less embittered thinking in yeah. the future of politics. Mm -hmm. So Northern Ireland can really move forward as one country and not just as separate two communities together. So in a way you'll be more like looking into the future and not yeah. as much yeah. in yeah. the yeah. past. Mm -hmm. You just need the right person. So say mm -hmm. someone in our generation to stand, like, stand forward and say, this, we need to change. Yeah. We need to move on and forgive. Kids that I would work with in South Belfast, they can't identify with politics because they don't, they've no faith in politicians. You know, loyalism in some areas has become vandalism. Dignity is so important. If we could all appreciate what, how dignified loyalism needs to be to make progress and, and give the young people the benefit of our experiences, they can learn from our mistakes. We're approaching the end and we've been talking about closure today. So I would like to give the opportunity to share some thoughts. The one thing that being involved in this kind of work, as I listen to everyone at the table, you, you listen to the context in, e in which each of, one, each of them made their decisions and, and there's an empathy there because I could imagine following the same course if I was subject to exactly the same pressures. And I think if, if, if you, if you'd have been, some of you at least, or if you'd have been born in the Midlands where I was from facing the world that I was facing, you may have followed my path into the army. So they I kind of have a, have, a, have a respect of all the paths you've taken because I've tried to understand the context. It all seems so natural maybe to see us sitting around a table like this. Yeah. You know, this is fantastic, I think. We have known each other for years and we've never been aggressive to each other. Well, we've never been the best of friends at times, you know, we've, we've, we've been objective and we've, we've said a few words, you know, contradictory. 
But I don't ever have a, I haven't had a problem with Michael. We do tend often to dwell on the negatives and what still needs to be done. And I think sometimes we forget how much we have achieved. The fact that we're sitting here in the first place um, can only point to greater understanding in the future. You know, all of us here, I'm, I'm sure I'm not very popular with some of my own constituency by being here today, but you know, somebody's got to show a lead and go forward and discuss and debate. So it's about talking, it's about trusting, it's about addressing fear, it's about showing leadership, and very importantly, it's about listening to the other person's story. Because for many years we didn't listen. We were right, and everybody else was wrong. But it's not as simple as that. Everybody has an equally valid story to tell. Okay, well, before we leave, I wanted to, to acknowledge your courage. I hope more and more people here and elsewhere in, in the world have the same courage that you have shown to, to engage in dialogue. I want to thank you for, for your commitment. I hope anyone who's interested can see what you have done, because I also agree with you that this can be very useful. These six people and the whole country have embarked on a long journey from violence to peace. There's so much that we can learn from them. No matter how much violence a community has suffered, once enemies start a dialogue, everything is possible. I'm leaving this country even more certain of the power of dialogue.